Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending January 17th. First up, I talked about the Falcon 9 rocket and the SpaceX uh, launch where they were working on recovering the first stage of the rocket by actually guiding it into a landing on a barge about the size of a football field. Well, I got some video on that, so I will put it up here. SpaceX itself posted the video, and they also allowed it to be saved, so I'm guessing they would not mind it being shared. It's about a seven-second video. I'll put it up right now so you can see what happened was they were close to a success, but the hydraulics failed on one side of it, so when it was coming in, it was not able to stay upright, so it, um, as you'll see in the video, it did tip over, so check this video out. Next up, this was sent to me, well it wasn't sent to me, this was actually posted by my friend uh, Gary Glover on the Dumpster Divers Facebook page. It's Techie, the, Furls, the world's first holographic 3D smartphone. And I will put up, this is the text that uh, Gary wrote on the site. I knew this 3D photography would be coming, I didn't know how holograms would work. This makes sense to me. And then the um, line under the video itself, which I'll post a link to the YouTube video, Techie is a sub-brand of the Chinese manufacturer S-Star and will be remembered as a creator of the world's first 3D holographic smartphone brought to you by telekinesa.com. And the nice thing about this is if it's what they show it to be in this video, the images actually pop out of the phone itself. They use some kind of eye tracking technology to get these 3D images to appear in your vision and if it's uh, anything like what they show it's going to be really fantastic because the one thing always lacking in 3D that people do not like um, is the glasses and uh, that even gives uh, certain people headaches and nausea and stuff like this and this is supposed to overcome that. This phone can even take 3D holograms with the dual lenses and you can use it supposedly for taking enough uh, accurate information to even do 3D modeling so you could use this phone as a I guess a type of 3D scanner and then if you had a 3D replicator uh, one of those $1,200-$1,500 uh, 3D uh, um, type of devices that make stuff out of plastics or whatever you can use this to input the data so uh, pretty good idea I hope they actually can translate this into TV sets so you can have glasses free 3D TV sets this next one, this is from the Telegraph, and this was sent by 1958 Shadow, 1954 Shadow, I'm sorry. Uh, Beagle 2 Probe rewrites history and vindicates Colin Pillinger. They're trying to make this almost like it's a really, um, they're trying to call it like a, a success, but um, basically even though they've found what appears to be the Beagle's landing spot on Mars, it's a, a little shiny picture about two to four pixels wide, I think, and... Um, they even some people say that it might have been possible that the reason why it uh, failed was because it bounced on its side. So um, they're saying they can get enough information from these limited pixel images to tell that all the uh, panels didn't quite deploy. So I don't know how you can get that from such a, a small pixel um, total image, but supposedly they can, and they uh, that's what they suspect. The reason why it did uh, maybe not do so much a hard landing, but... Uh, the panels may have been because of the fact it got dented or, or damaged in some way that the panels didn't all unfold. So they got no actual data from the Beagle 2 lander, but um, it's an interesting article anyway. I mean, they did actually, you know, they s said they half expected to find a crash site where it would be laying shattered in pieces all over the place. So um, at least that much of it was successful that it did end up touching down. Basically, it looks like to be mostly intact. If you, Like I said, if you can tell that from just a few pixels, I... I don't know what kind of skills these imaging people have, but um, evidently they're able to tell that much about it. But a pretty lengthy article here in the Telegraph, and uh, well worth reading if you're into this kind of stuff. And uh, next, this is Disco Clam Lights Up to Scare Predators Away. Um, this is kind of cool. I'll just read a little bit of the first part of the article here. The bright orange-lipped Disco Clam, and I'll try to pronounce this, Stenoides ailes became a phenomenon last year when researchers learned that its dazzling display, and there's a video above where you can see it, proved to be reflections of ambient light and not light produced by the clams themselves. Now that same team has strong evidence that these blinking streaks are telling would-be predators beware. Um, they conducted studies and tried to see if maybe, at first they thought it was maybe some kind of a display to attract other clams or something, but um, they said clams themselves don't even react to the display from each other. so. That was not the possibility, but they noticed that uh, a predator shrimp, when they saw the lights flashing, recoiled away. And uh, also this thing has uh, uh, some kind of uh, 
let's see. Well, let me just read the rest of the article here. Um, the clams, which live off Indonesia flesh twice as much when they spot predators, and when a peacock mantis shrimp attacks one of these six centimeter long clams, the shrimp quickly recoils as if stung or tasting something really terrible. The researchers reported here today that the annual meeting of the Society for Integrative and Comparative Biology, they found that the clam has sulfur in its fleshy lips and tentacles and suspect that like another clam species that drop tentacles laden with sulfuric acid to deter predators, the disco clam sulfur also gets converted into a distasteful substance. So um, it's a predator warning system. I guess it's like a lot of things in nature. Maybe uh, the very first time a young shrimp tries to attack it, it finds out it's uh, not a good thing. Kind of like dealing, I guess, kind of like a dog dealing with a skunk, only uh, this is happening underwater. And another new thing, too, this is kind of neat for uh, the fact that if you've uh, been following the news at all, you know that many, many bacteria are becoming resistant to modern day antibiotics. This was sent to me by Brenda J. Thank you for sending this in. The New York Times. The um, article title is New Antibiotic Stirs Hope Against Resistant Bacteria. An unusual method for producing antibiotics may help solve an urgent global problem, the rise in infections that resist treatment with commonly used drugs and the lack of new antibiotics to replace them that no longer work. The method which extracts drugs from bacteria that lives in dirt has yielded a powerful new antibiotic, researchers reported in the journal Nature on Wednesday. The new drug, and I'll try to pronounce this right, Tiaxobactin, I think, was tested in mice and easily cured severe infections with no side effects. Better still, the researchers said the drug works in a way that makes it unlikely that bacteria will become, it, that bacteria will become resistant to it, and the method developed to produce the drug has the potential to unlock a trove of natural compounds to fight infections and cancer, molecules that were previously beyond scientists' reach because of the microbes that produced them could not be grown in the laboratory. So that's kind of easy to do. I mean, if you can harvest them from soil easily and uh, be able to extract whatever to produce the antibiotic whatever, uh, maybe we'll have a, at least another good 20, 30 years where we'll not have to deal with infections without having some powerful tools to fight in, against them, especially things like hospital staff infections that are getting very, very resistant to treatment. But the article goes on and on for lots and lots of paragraphs if you're interested in, in reading more. And so uh, check out the links below. And if you're not a member and you're on Facebook, um, think about joining the Dumpster Divers group on Facebook. I would appreciate it. And thank you, everybody, for your contributions. As usual, it's what makes the show easy to do and what makes it enjoyable to do. So take care, everybody. I will catch you next week.